Welcome back, everybody. And uh, as usual, this is going to be a very short introduction. So I'm just going to say that I'm very pleased and honored to have Peter Kivesh as our speaker today. He's going to be talking about isoperimetric stability. Okay. Uh, well, yes, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, isoperimetric stability, so uh, broadly interpreted to include, include isoperimetry and various other kinds of geometrical and analytic questions, and, uh, and also some applications of, of these ideas to problems in uh, combinatorics and probability and, and group theory. Okay, so um, let me get started by talking a bit about isoperimetry and stability. So the, uh, the, the classical isoperimetric problem in the Euclidean setting is just asking about the, uh, so I mean, so generally we're, uh, the kind of isoperimetric question which we're considering is you have, you have some object of given uh, volume, whatever you, your meaning of volume is, and you want to minimize its boundary, whatever the meaning of boundary is. So in the uh, Euclidean setting, volume is what you think it is, the boundary is the surface area of the shape, and the statement is that among all shapes of given volume, the ball has the smallest surface area. Um, so, so this is very classical. Um, uh, and then there's a, a, a long line of research trying to understand the stability of this inequality. So if I tell you that the surface area is close to minimum, does it tell you that you're uh, very close to a ball? And the, uh, the sharp form of this is uh, a result of uh, Fusco, Maggi, and Pertelli. So the, uh, kind of the statement which we'd be saying is we have some shape which is um, uh, we're going to say that the, the, the measure of the... Uh, the surface, uh, um, let's say, it's called S there, is less than some, uh, so, the, uh, so the size is equal to the size of a ball. Uh, the, uh, the, the measure is within a factor one plus delta of, of the minimum, and then we want to say that this is, uh, implies that the, uh, the distance between S and the ball is less than some epsilon fraction. And we want to know what is, epsilon as, as a function of, of delta. So this would be the, uh, the quantitative meaning of the stability question. Um, so the, uh, the sharp result there is that epsilon scales like the uh, square root of delta. So. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is in the continuous setting. Then it, um, there are various problems you can ask in the discrete setting. So the, uh, the most classical concerns the, uh, the cube. So the... Uh, uh, so we have binary vectors of length n, and the edges, so it's a graph, the, uh, the edges are connect pairs which are at Hamming distance one. Uh, and then there are a couple of ways you can think about the boundary. So, the, so first of all, the, size, the volume is just the number of uh, elements in your set. And then one way to measure the edge boundary is to think about the, sorry, one way to measure the boundary is to think about um, edges. So if I look at the edges which go from my set to the complement, then this is a measure of boundary. Uh, and the classical result says that, that the, if you want to minimize the uh, edge boundary for given size, the best thing you can do is to take subcubes, at least if your size happens to be a subcube and there's some interpolation in between this. So for example, if I, if I tell you that you're going to take half of all of the points, and you want to minimize the edge boundary, the best thing you can do would be to take a, a co-dimension one uh, subcube. Um, uh, so again, there's a, a long line of, of research on uh, the stability of this inequality. So, um, uh, and uh, roughly what, what these results say is, is that the, uh, if, you're, if you're, similarly to, to this statement here, if you're close to having the minimum possible boundary, then you're close to being to the extremal structure. So one version of this, I, I was I distinguished between the, the what this is this kind of statement here is is a is a, a 99 called a 99 percent stability result. But it says that if you're a, if you're if you're close to the uh, the minimum, then I tell you 99 percent of the structure. Like it's you, you're, there's only a, um, a very small fraction which you don't know. Uh, but there's also the um, one percent stability result, which is where I say that the um, just that you're within a constant factor. Uh, and then this is tell you some structure. So this is a, 
kind of 1% stability result. And these 1% stability tends to be a much harder thing to understand. And uh, typically in this kind of uh, setting, we, we just ask for some correlation with, with, an, with a, an extremal example, or uh, a, a tighter form of that would be to say that you're a union of extremal examples. So this is what uh, uh, we proved uh, with Long and also proved by Keller and Lifshitz for this uh, edge isoparametric problem is that the uh, if you're within the, uh, well, uh, there is a one percent stability result, it's, it's uh, which says that you're approximated by a union of subcubes. Um, another notion of of boundary is to look at vertices. So I look at vertices which are uh, um, in my uh, not in my set, but which are adjacent to something in my in the set, and here the uh, the uh, extremal example would be to look at uh, Hamming balls. So if I yeah, so draw my, my cube in this kind of picture and then this is my set, then the, uh, the things which are on the boundary would be like if this is a uh, like sets of size k. Uh, then right, my, my, set, my family consisted of sets of size at, at most k, then the boundary would be sets of size k. So the uh, Hamming balls are the minimizers and then um, uh, with Long and independently by Shutsky and Roberts, there's a st stability result for this, um, which says that, again, similar kind of thing, if, if, the, if the boundary is close to minimum, then you're close in structure to a, to a ball. But uh, here, we're, like the, uh, the level of precision of these results is, uh, is weaker, and so we don't know sharp results here, and we don't know 1% stability results of this kind. Um, okay, so this is to introduce the uh, the general subject, uh, what is isoparametry, uh, what is stability? Um, any questions on that? Is there a conjecture for the 1% stability? Is it going to be a union of Hamming balls that's free? Uh, I would conjecture that. I don't, I, yeah. it's, uh, I don't know if that's, if, if that's an official conjecture or not. But, yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right. So this, um, so these are nice questions in, in their own right, and they're also uh, uh, connected to uh, some conjectures of Kahn and Kalai, which uh, uh, had a uh, big role in shaping a lot of research in probabilistic combinatorics. Um, so here, the, the setting is that we're uh, thinking of uh, thresholds of some unknown property, say in the erdos Reni random graph. Uh, so there's um, this um, well-known picture which you get when you, you plot the, uh, the probability of, uh, uh, so I consider um, the probability parameters to be, and then I, uh, I plot the, the probability that GNP has some property P, and what we see is, uh, is that for a while it's close to zero, then it transitions uh, fairly quickly to be close to one. And then this happens around some threshold probability PC. Um, and so we, we want to understand this. Um, I also want to think about this in terms of Boolean functions. I want to uh, identify a property with its uh, characteristic function, which is uh, a zero one value function, one meaning you're in the, in the properties or not, and uh, and the the space uh, is uh, all graphs, which I can think of as uh, in terms of binary vectors indexed by the edges of the complete graph. Um, uh, and the uh, so the connection with the uh, isoparametric problems comes from thinking about the uh, the derivative of this function. So the uh, uh, the derivative is a quantity called the influence, which is a, uh, a p-biased version of the edge boundary, which I was discussing on, on the previous slide. So if we, um, uh, so the, uh, if we, if we generalize the, the kinds of question which we were looking at on the previous slide, that describing the, the, sh the structure of, uh, of uh, set, sets or properties which are, um, have a, a small, uh, p-biased uh, edge boundary, then we're thinking about the, uh, the structure of properties which uh, have a coarse uh, transition in this probability function. Um, uh, 
Okay, so, so Kahn and Kalai wrote about this and they made uh, several conjectures of which uh, the most uh, famous one is, was solved recently. This is the uh, uh, expectation threshold uh, conjecture saying that the, uh, so the, if you want to understand this, uh, this uh, threshold at which the property goes from having probability zero to one, at least approximately up to some factor, uh, logarithmic factor, then uh, you can look at a much simpler parameter, which is just uh, to, given my expectation. So, for example, if, I, if my property was uh, the, containing a particular graph, uh, so the set of G such that they contain some fixed graph H, um, then I could say that the, right, the probability that, that uh, G M P is in P is, right, so it's, it's at most the expected number of copies of H. Um, and if this was uh, less than one, then uh, much less than one, then, then you're, you'd be in this, this regime. And I could do this also for the expected number of copies of H prime, where um, so I can take it at a minimum over subgraphs of H. Um, and, and then this, so this gives us a, 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 a uh, uh, so expectation bound for where where this threshold might be, and the surprising thing about this conjecture is that this uh, really tells you the, the truth up to this log factor. Um, so when um, Kahn and Kai, Kalai closed this conjecture, they uh, they also suggested that it could be helpful to understand the uh, the uh, the structure of of uh, uh, properties for which this you 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 have a you don't have a sharp threshold here. So uh, can you say that there's some local structure? Um, and this, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of literature on this, uh, including uh, results of Friedgut and Bourguin, which predate this, uh, this work of Kahn and Kalai, where they're, um, so uh, Friedgut used, used these ideas to describe, uh, to prove general results on the existence of sharp thresholds, which uh, um, was surprising at the time that you could, there, there's this sort of general an analytic machinery for, for saying that a property like satisfiability has a sharp threshold without really getting into the details of the property, just using the fact that it doesn't have any uh, loca local, it's not a local property. Um, so, right, so I'll refer to these kinds of results here as, as being sort of um, analytic uh, stability results where you're, you're describing the, the uh, uh, the structure which you can get from saying that uh, you have a, a in general some some function, uh, and you're you're assuming that the you have some bounds um, on the on the influence, which is saying that uh, in terms of this picture that you have a a coarse threshold, um, and the setting uh, for uh, Friedgut and Bourguin uh, is here is is that you're uh, in a dense regime. So these are functions whose measure is bounded away from zero and bounded away from one. So it's uh, not the sort of necessarily the, the typical things which you consider in probabilistic combinatorics where uh, densities are tending to zero, but still it uh, captures a, a lot of interesting problems. Um, and so, um, uh, so okay, so the, the, the statement is, is that if you, uh, if you, have this bound on on the on the influence on the uh, uh, the p-weighted boundary, then you get some correlation with a subcube. So you can find a a, a subcube of a small co-dimension just depending on this this constant k, just in fact linear in this k, where you have a significant increase in density, an um, amount just depending on on k. So the uh, in Bourguin's uh, paper, this is uh, e to the minus order k squared, and then uh, we, um, with uh, Lifshitz, Long, and Mintz, uh, improved this to the, the sharp bound, which is uh, something which is just exponential in the constant times k. Uh, th this is uh, uh, sharp for, for tribes, uh, which is a nasty Boolean function. Um, and, and we also considered the, uh, uh, the sharp, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the sparse regime, so the, uh, the situation where uh, you, uh, you're, you're, there's no assumption on, on the measure being bounded away from zero one, uh, and then uh, and here the natural thing to do, well, 
is to make an assumption on the influence which is relative to the measure. And then, uh, again, you get this, this uh, strong correlation. So um, this is kind of an answer to, the, uh, to their second question in, in some ways, except that this is not how they phrase their second question. It's, uh, it's a, you could say it's a, it's a variant form of, of, their, of their conjecture. Okay, um, so, um, so now, now I want to think uh, more, more broadly about uh, uh, other kinds of discrete, discrete isoperometric questions. So it's, there's, there's no reason to particularly stick to the cube with, um, right, you can ask this question for any finite graph and it's, a, uh, or, or even a, a you can ask it in lattices as well. It's a uh, natural class of problems which uh, sort of lead in the direction of additive combinatorics. Uh, so if I, uh, if I th think about um, uh, uh, so I'm working in a lat D-dimensional lattice and then I'm going to think about the, uh, uh, the uh, Cayley graph on this lattice with some generating set B. So this is, means that I join uh, each uh, element x to x plus plus b. So the uh, and then I can ask um, for I, the isoperimetric question in this Cayley graph. So if, again, so given a set of, of a given size, uh, uh, what is the size of its vertex boundary or edge boundary in this in this Cayley graph? Um, and this um, is the same thing as just asking about the size of the sum set a plus b. Um, so, uh, so I could ask, what, what, is, what are the extremal examples, and then um, do you have stability? Uh, so this uh, question was considered by Ruja, um, who uh, showed that the, uh, the approximate minimum is given by convex progressions. So if, in this example uh, here, I'm, the, these green arrows are showing you the directions of my, my Cayley graph. So I'm imagining that my set B has the uh, 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 is this 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 1, minus 1. So these are my uh, vectors in B. And then, and then I ask, what if I take a large set A, how do I minimize A plus B? And the answer is you, you take this, this triangle, which is the con convex olive here, blow that up and take the, the lattice points. And this is the uh, approximately e extremal example. Um, and so with Barber and Erder and Roberts, we, sh we showed that you, there's a, you have stability for this this problem. So if you're if you're close to uh, having a minimum boundary, then you, you're close to this one of these structures. And, and there's a, a related statement for the edge boundary, which I won't I won't get into. Um, okay. So when when we go in this direction, it's it's um, it's it's then very natural to to say, well, um, there are lots of other questions about some sets where we don't necessarily think that uh, B is fixed and A is large. There's uh, uh, you might think that A and B have comparable sizes, for instance. So this is the, uh, the direction of the uh, uh, brim minkowski type inequalities. Uh, so, um, so for uh, brim minkowski so let, it's, it's easier to start with a continuous setting. So, um, so now we're, gonna, uh, we're thinking about just uh, bodies which are in d-dimensional space, and we want to know uh, what is the smallest possible measure of a plus B given uh, the measures of A and B. Um, and so this is answered by this statement here. So the, um, so the, uh, the way it works is you get an inequality which is uh, sharp for uh, convex sets that are homothetic. So for example, if I take uh, a box and then I add another box, which is, uh, in the same alignment, maybe scale, then I get some bigger box. Or uh, um, I take a ball, I add it to some other ball, then I get a, a bigger ball. And this, uh, this, is, this is true whenever I take some convex body and, and a, a dilate of it, I add it together. So, and, I, and the way the, um, uh, the measure scale is, is that this, uh, right, this, if this has uh, measure, uh, a to the D, and this has measure B to the D, and this has measure A plus B to the D. So, uh, so when you take the D through, it's you just you get a, a, a linear relation. Um, so, 
So again, sort of similarly to the, the story for the uh, Euclidean isoparametric inequality, there's a long history of uh, stability for this, these kinds of inequalities. Can you say that if, if you're close to uh, minimi having minimizers in this example, that A and B should be close to uh, homothetic convex sets? And, the, uh, and the, the, uh, the sharp version of this statement was obtained recently by Figali, Van Hilton, and Tiber. And it's, uh, Analogous to the the results for Euclidean isoparametry, that you uh, you get the, uh, the so the uh, the sharp dependence between the uh, uh, the, the uh, parameters. Um, okay, so this uh, this is in the continuous setting. Um, uh, in the discrete setting, uh, you have to think a bit about what the right question is. Um, so it's uh, if I if I take uh, subsets of a lattice and I ask um, how big are, is A plus B? Well, um, A and B could just pretend that they live in one dimension, not, not see the lattice. Like if I just, if A and B were both equal to an arithmetic pr progression, then um, A plus B would only, right, say they were the same, then A plus B, B would only uh, be twice as big. So that you wouldn't see this kind of, uh, uh, right, the, in the, right, the continuous setting would be like, for example, if, uh, if the, uh, if A and B have sets, if I have A and B of equal measure in R D, then uh, the measure of A plus B is at least uh, two to the D times the measure of A. Right? You get this uh, factor which is uh, two D in the dimension. But in the discrete setting, uh, you you have to have some non-degeneracy assumption which says that you really are d-dimensional to get to see this kind of growth. So the uh, uh, a natural way to do this, uh, which suggested by by Ruger, is to assume that your your sets are thick, or at least one of your sets are thick. So here, uh, my assumption is that you can't, can't be covered by a small number of hyperplanes. Uh, so if I say that it's uh, uh, h thick, I'm saying you need at least h hyperplanes to cover my set. So this is a measure of being if H is large, it's saying that I look like a d-dimensional uh, set. Uh, uh, and in, indeed, so the, if, you're, uh, if you take this thickness to be large, depending on, on your dimension and some parameter epsilon that you're interested in, then you get essentially the, the bound which you would get for, uh, for Brim-Minkowski with an error coming from this epsilon. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's, uh, there's also the stability uh, question for this, which is uh, at least in, in, the, in the case of uh, when A and B are equal sets, is uh, there's a result of Van Hinton spin contiba, which gives a stability result. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so uh, the problems which I was discussing uh, on the previous slide were all 99% stability results. So uh, I, uh, at, the, at the beginning, I was, I was saying well, right, there, there were these uh, distinguishing between these 99% and 1% stability results. So the 1% stability results are where uh, instead of saying that my, my uh, boundary is within a, a 1 plus delta factor of the minimum where delta is small, I, I give you a, a weaker assumption just that it's within a constant factor. And I still want to make some kind of uh, structural statement, although it's inevitably going to be much weaker. And it's, I, I'm not going to, I can't say that I'm near to an extremal example. I, the best I can hope to say is, is that I'm uh, maybe covered by a, an, a much larger extremal example or covered by some number of extremal examples. Um, so in additive, uh, commoners or X, the classic question of this kind, which has driven a lot of research, is uh, Freiman's theorem. So this is a, a statement exactly like this in the integers. If you, uh, if you had a set of integers and uh, the doubling is, uh, is some constant, um, then you have some structure that you can put your set A inside a, a generalized arithmetic progression uh, where the dimension of this progression is constant and also the the efficiency of the covering, so the, the amount by which it's larger uh, than your original set is also a constant. So this is a very nice uh, uh, qualitative statement, uh, but it's, 
uh, interesting, to, uh, particularly from the point of view of applications in computer science, to, to say, uh, can we make these constants effective? Can, can they be polynomial? Uh, and so this is the, um, uh, the question, so formulated by uh, uh, Martin, also, also known as the polynomial Freiman Ruger conjecture. Um, so uh, we, we can't hope to put our set inside a single uh, object uh, progression, uh, but perhaps we can, there's, we can, if we relax and we allow ourselves to cover by uh, several uh, uh, progressions, so uh, similarly to the, uh, the discussion earlier of isoprometry in the cube, we didn't, we didn't approximate by a single cube, we approximated by uh, uh, several cubes. So, um, right, so then, right, so the setting is um, I want uh, to put my, my set A inside so x plus p, so x is a set of translates, p is a progression, uh, is actually going to be a, a convex progression rather than a, a, so the intersection of a convex set with a lattice rather than a generalized arithmetic progression. So you have to be a, a bit more broad in, in your definition of what is a, a basic object. Uh, and we want polynomial dependence. So if I call the doubling 2 to the d, um, I want the dimension, I want the sharp dimension, so it's, um, doubling two to the D should correspond to D dimensional objects. And then the, in the terms of the number of translates and the covering efficiency, I'm I want just a polynomial dependence. So if it's, I want to go from two to the D to two to the order of D. Um, so a statement very cl close to this was uh, recently proved by um, Gowers, Green, Manners, and, and Tao. So they uh, proved that the, there's an analogous statement of polynomial Freiman Ruger in the finite field setting, which they proved. And the consequence of in the, in the integer setting is that you can almost get this, this statement here. Uh, you, uh, you lose uh, something in the dimension and you get the right number of translates, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the real uh, loss is in the size of the progression which you're using. It's uh, doubly exponential rather than, right, it's exponential in, in the doubling. So that's a... Uh, um, but anyway, exciting progress. Um, so uh, another related result uh, with joint with uh, Van, Van Hinsen, we, uh, we uh, ask for, uh, so if I, I'm gonna imp impose some non-degeneracy condition on, on the set, it's similar to the kind of uh, condition which I was talking about in, uh, in terms of thickness, although uh, I'm, I'm working in, in Z, so it has to be defined appropriately in terms of uh, thinking about the uh, appropriate uh, uh, model under Freiman uh, isomorphism. But that's, I, I won't get into the, the details of exactly what this, this condition is. Uh, but then, if I give you a non-degenerate set, can you get uh, sharp bounds for the dimension and the locality, so the number of different places for this, this set? Um, so, uh, so one... So, so to set things up here, so I, I've got a, a sub subset of integers, um, uh, and the doubling is between two to the d and two to the d plus one. And it's, uh, I'm gonna say that this, this parameter L, so is, uh, which I'm gonna think should be the number of locations, this, I'm supposing that my, maybe if, if I could write it in, in, a, in a clearer way as, um, I'm, my setting is, is that the size of A plus A is equal to 2 to the D plus L times A. So L is uh, at least 0 and at most 2 to the D. And I want to, I want to say, okay, then uh, I should be able to cover my, uh, my set by uh, some number of convex progressions, d-dimensional. What's the sharp number? The answer is L plus 1. So for... Um, uh, yeah. So, for example, if uh, the uh, if your doubling is less than two to the L, two to the d plus one, then you can cover by a single progression. But then, as soon as you get to exactly two to the d plus one, it's no longer true because if I have a, a convex progression and then a a point which is far away, then um, I can't cover that by a single progression because of bounded size because that point could be arbitrarily far away. Um, yeah, so 
Um, so the, it, the general form of this, this theorem requires a lot of machinery in terms of uh, refining Freiman's theorem and to include various separation properties. But in this case, which I was just discussing about the threshold two to the d plus one, if I, if I switch settings to uh, continuous sets in, in RD, then I, there's, a, there's a simple geometric proof, which I could, I could show you. So it's... Um, So the, uh, so the statement is, is that um, uh, um, so I'm given, I see, I see that I've, I've used, uh, right, I'm, I'm writing uh, my convention in, on, here is that I've written just size of A for, to mean the measure of A, because I'm working in the continuous set. Uh, so this is A in, in a continuous set in, in R to D. I'm writing uh, bars of A to, to denote the measure. Um, and, and my assumption is that the, uh, the measure of A plus A is less than 2 to the D plus 1 times the, the measure of A. And I want to, I want to prove that, that you can actually put A inside a convex set, which is not too large compared with A. Um, so suppose that's not true. So let's, let me assume that the, that the measure of the convex hull is extremely large as in, compared with A. Um, so by doing linear transformations, I can assume that it's large in every coordinate direction. This is a, uh, not, not hard to see. So I'm going to assume that every, in every coordinate direction, um, there are points. I don't necessarily have a, a, a large, uh, uh, right, it's, uh, it can, it can, the, the points don't have to line up, but like I, 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 can't, I can't squeeze my set between two, uh, two parallel hyperplanes which are close together. So that's my setting. Um, and now um, there's a, a useful inequality of Plunica which, which tells, tells me that I, I can't have a large fiber in every direction. So like if I, if I have, a, if my set contains I've drawn it as if it was consecutive, but it's a, uh, uh, right, if I have a um, large measure here in, in this, uh, let's say this is a, say I'm working in three direction, three dimensions and I've got X, Y, and Z. So if I have a large, uh, a, fi a, a, a fiber in, in the X direction with large measure, uh, in the Y direction and in the Z direction, then when I, when I form the, there's some set there, Threefold subset, then I get a, a a set of large large measure. So it's um, and but I uh, from knowing that a plus a is 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 small, I know that any iterated subset I have a bound on any iterated subset. Um, so I know that there's some direction where I don't have long fibers, and then I can do a. Um, uh, an argument of averaging over these fibers. So if I, I'm going to say this, so this is an R to the D minus one, and then this is, I'll draw here uh, uh, coordinate D in this direction. And then I just want to do um, one dimensional analysis in, in, in this direction. So it's, uh, if I'm looking at, I can, I'll assume that the, that I, in, at, I'll translate so that I have uh, uh, in at, at the origin here, I have two points which are very, very well separated at difference zero and L. And then uh, if I take any other point X and then I look at sort of where is, uh, like what, what do I see in terms of the, the fiber of, of the sum, sum set at X, then I can, there are two natural ways I, c I can get that. I can think of like taking the point x over two and adding that to itself, and that will give me something here. And then I can also take whatever I happen to have at, uh, at x, and then adding that to itself, and adding that to zero and l, and I get a x plus plus l. So it's uh, uh, so the it's, it's very helpful to have have the property that I have short fibers in this direction, and I also have two points which are far apart, right? So if you, if you put that together, there's a, a simple 
application of Kepperman's inequality, which gives you a lower bound on the on, on the fibers in the sum set, you get uh, what you would get just from the uh, the minimum. Just right, you get twice in it. If I just take a particular fiber and double it, then that would give me uh, twice as much. And if I were to just use that information, then I would just um, what would come out would be a two to the d bound, which is like a, what you would just get from Brominkowski. But this extra uh, L gives you, a, gives you get, is what gives you the plus one. So when you write down this inequality and integrate, then you you uh, you get the uh, two to the d, which is a kind of the minimum you could possibly have, and then an extra uh, plus one from this this thing. So it's a uh, Yeah, and also in this non-degeneracy assumption, which I, I didn't, which I didn't tell you about. Ah, okay. right, so it's. Uh, okay. And yeah. how about the constant of um, the the D and the side Um In theory, you could work out what it is, but we didn't. Ah, okay. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But the the main weakness in this result is in the non-degeneracy assumption. Like it's somehow like it's like if there are counterexamples to polynomial frame and Rouge, they, they, they look kind of weird and degenerate and like it's, uh, but it's, but, but, but we don't really understand those. But, but, but. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to talk a bit about some um, applications of, of these uh, isoparametric ideas. So, th so this is uh, about applications in extremal combinatorics. Um, so there are a number of applications of this kind. And so by way of illustration, I'm going to just talk, illustrate the, the simplest example, which is the odish Colorado theorem. So, so this is something where, right, that's, so the, okay, so just go over the statement. So we're uh, c considering a family of sets of size k living in a world of size n, and they have the property that they're intersecting. So uh, any two sets in my family have a um, non-empty intersection. What's the maximum size uh, when n is at least two, 2k? The best thing you can do is to fix a particular element and take everything that contains that element. So that's a, called a star or a, a dictator. So we want to, uh, that's the ex extremal problem. And then the stability question is if, you're, uh, uh, if you have a reasonably large set, uh, can, you, can you describe the structure? Can you say that it's, it's a, uh, approximately equal to a star. Um, so there's a, there's a, a more complete theorem of Frankel, uh, which g gives a very precise answer to this question, but it's still it's instructive to, to see what you can do uh, uh, using these kind of isoparametric ideas or sharp thresholds. So this is uh, uh, following uh, Diener and Friedgut. And the, the idea is, um, so, um, so I have my uh, my family. So I'm drawing the, the cube again, um, and then I'm thinking of my family as living in uh, sets of size k, which is p times n. P is quite small. Uh, p is a small constant, maybe a hundredth, um, and. And then I'm going to form, form the, uh, the upward closure. So here's my set A. And then I'm going to form the upward closure, which is everything which contains something in A. So I get this uh, uh, function on, uh, on the Boolean cube, or uh, family in the Boolean cube, still intersecting, so I just closed it upwards. And I want to switch to the, the natural uh, bias measure, which is P bias measure, where P is, is a fra fraction of K. So the uh, uh, this measure is concentrated near this level, so, that, so I, I didn't do much in terms of uh, the setup of the problem. Um, and now the observation is, so the, if I look at my, this family under the uniform measure, it's at most a, the measure is at most a half, because right, you can just pair each set with its complement. You can't have both of them. Um, and so this, this uh, threshold picture here tells, is, says that you have to have a, a coarse threshold, right? otherwise you you would, you would contradict this, uh, uh, um, 
you know, there's these two bounds. You have a lower bound on the measure, which is constant, an upper bound, which is constant. Right? You have to have a place in the middle where the derivative is, is bounded. Um, and then this uh, result of Frege that I mentioned earlier tells you that your, your set is well approximated by a, a Hunza. So there's a, a small number of coordinates, just depending on this parameter, these parameters p and epsilon, where I can t uh, your, your set is essentially out of small edits of your set, I can, I can tell you whether you're in, in the set just by looking at these, this small number of coordinates. Um, and this is really the heart of, of, like, of the stability. And then you need to, uh, to, to do a bit of combinatorial work to, to see exactly what's going on. But basically now if I just look at the, 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 the vertices which are, have large degree, there's only a, there's, there, is, there is at least one and there's only a constant number and it's impossible to have more than one because the direct combinatorial arguments show you that there's just right, two different vertices of high degree uh, can't, can't be intersecting. Um, all right, so this, so this is an illustration, but then there's, there's, there are several other kinds of uh, uh, harder questions of this nature which you can, uh, we can approach by this, these kinds of techniques. So, so there's uh, uh, maybe the, uh, the main sort of open question in this, in this general direction is uh, conjecture of Erdős, which is saying what happens if I uh, change Erdős Corrado. So Erdős Corrado re rephrased is asking for the largest uniform family not containing a matching of size two. So let's, instead of forbidding a matching of size two, let's forbid a matching of some particular size and ask for the extreme, extreme what's, what's the, the largest thing you can do. And then there are two natural things you can do. You can take a star on S minus one point. So if you have S minus one points that hit all of your sets, then obviously there's no matching of size S. And another thing you could do is just pack everything in a set that's too small. If I take a clique of size KS minus one, there's not enough space to have a matching of size S. So the conjecture is that the, uh, uh, one of these two things is optimum. Uh, so yeah, Frank will prove this when N is at least uh, constant times uh, S times K, and, and a conjecture of Huang, Lo, and Sudikov, which we proved with Lushitz, Long, and Mincer, is, is that you can do this in a, in a cross setting. So if I, now I, I have S families which live in the same set, and I want to forbid a cross matching. So this is a matching where I take one set from, from the first family, one set from the second family, and so on. Uh, and, uh, the, and the statement is they can't, uh, the extremal example in terms of the minimum size is that they're all equal to a star, right? If uh, right, there is a, at least one of them whose size is at most of that of the star. Um, and so this is, this is an, an interesting problem in terms of, uh, I mean, interesting in its own right, but also in terms of the method of, of proof, because it's natural to try and follow this kind of setup. But the, the problem is that in general, you're, you have to consider a value of the probability, which is tending to zero with n. So the, the sharp threshold, the, the, the free got, got sh sharp threshold result is inapplicable. And this is one of the motivations for these, um, the, the sharp threshold results, which are in the analytic stability results, which I was discussing earlier in the talk. Um, and so, so those results and also uh, this, um, we, we developed a, a method of, of uh, global hypercontractivity, which I may say, say a bit about. Um, and, and this gives a, a, a sharp threshold result which is applicable to these kinds of problems. So if I, in this, this statement here, I'm considering, uh, I'm comparing the, the measure of, of some function f at, at two values p and q which are quite close to each other, and I'm supposing I have a coarse threshold so that I'm only increasing by uh, some constant factor, and the conclusion, similarly to the, the statements which I was saying before, is that you find a co-dimension, uh, uh, constant co-dimension subcube on which you have a, a dramatically in, increase in density. Um, and so this uh, sort of plays, uh, is the analytic ingredient which plays, plays the role in, in a strategy like this in, in more general problems of this nature. I mean, it's a, there's, there's a lot of combinatorial stuff to do after that, but this is the thing which really gets you off the ground. Um, okay, so maybe I should say a, a bit about the, the analysis 
behind it. So, um, so if I start, I'm going to talk about global hypercontractivity, but I'll start by talking about hypercontractivity. Um, and this is perhaps clearest to introduce it through its uh, main application in combinatorics and, and, and thresholds as uh, given by Kahn, Kalai, and Lineal, and, 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 and m many others. It's a big, big line of research. And the sort of the slogan here is, is that if I have a Boolean function on the cube with uniform measure, um, which is sparse, it has a small expectation, then it's approximately high degree. That's the only way this can happen. Um, so, the, the, uh, so a precise statement is, um, is like this. So if I, um, the, uh, if I, I can have a, a function f and then I look at its, its low degree truncation, and then I can get a bound on this truncation, which is if the measure is very small, is, is right. It, you, you should be comparing this with the measure of f, but it's actually the measure of f to the 3 half. So that's something which is much smaller if the measure is small. And then there's a, there's a, a, a loss which is exponential in, in the degree. But if, if we're talking about low degree functions, then you can just treat that as a constant. Um, and so the proof of this lemma is, is an application of, of Holder's inequality. And then the key hypercontractive inequality, which is to say that you can control uh, the four norm of a low degree function in terms of its two norm. Um, so this is, um, this is one formulation of hypercontractivity. The usual formulation is, goes in terms of the, uh, the noise operator, which is where you, you think of, I have, my, I have a, a function or a set, and I replace it by a smooth version where uh, at each point I take a, a, a local average. So it's, I, I take my points, I flip a, a small number of bits, I take the average of, of what I see there. Um, so it, it's a smoothing operator, and um, right, so the, uh, the statement that this operator is contractive from uh, L2 to L4 is equivalent to this, this statement that low degree functions um, have comparable L, L4 and L2 norms. Um, and this gives a route to uh, many kinds of um, analytic isoparametric inequality so this small set expansion is is a is a is a is another is a sort of combinatorial formulation of this of this contraction it says that if you have a a, a small set in the cube that, and then you take a, a small number of random steps then you you quickly expand right you, you're unlikely to end up back in your set um, okay so the the point is that all of this stuff is very much using the fact that you're uh, well, initially, it's, it was all stated for the uniform measure. It was then extended to uh, const, uh, p bias measure for p constant. But it, there's a fundamental obstacle if you try to take p uh, tending to zero with n, which is the statement is just not true, right? If, if I if I take just a dictator, like a, uh, right, this is a function whose expectation is p, which could be very small if p is small, um, and it's not at all high degree. It's very much low degree. Um, so the, the, the idea of global hypercontractivity is to remove these obstacles. So you, you identify, you say, that, okay, the obstacle to this kind of statement is uh, correlation with a low degree function or with a, with a if you're, if you're uh, in the monotone setting just with a, with a subcube. So it's a, you want to say if I, if I remove these, uh, uh, these obstructions, I assume that my, my set is global rather than local. Um, then you re recover this, this contractive property, whatever the, uh, the probability is. Um, and this is, this is the key to, um, uh, so this, is, this, is, this statement is a more precise version of that. It's basically analogous to this, this lemma here, but with the, 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 the assumption of, of being global, and, uh, and then you see this coming out in terms of the, the kind of bound which you get on for the, the truncation. Uh, I didn't give you the definition, no. So it, I, I want to say that the so this uh, d delta global it means that if you if you restrict to a, a subcube of uh, co-dimension at most d, then you, your density increment is at most delta. Right. Right. Um, and then so then this uh, this analytic uh, stability statement, which I said was a variant form of the kahn kalai conjecture, uh, is basically. A, Follows by com combining this statement here with just the bounds you get by like if, if your if your influence is small then you can't have too much weight on the high levels because 
it's just right, the, the, that's just what the Fourier for, formula for the influence tells you. Um, maybe I say, yes, I won't go into that. Maybe I, I want to say it uh, a bit about some of, some of the other applications. So this this uh, this global hypercontractivity has has had a lot of applications. Um, uh, I mean, there are, there are other applications in our paper, but also some other applications um, which are in computational complexity. So there's a, a two to the two games conjecture, which is a variant of the unique games conjecture, uh, testability of codes. Um, and then recently, uh, we, are, we uh, found applications in, for extremal problems in, in a group setting. So uh, maybe I say a bit about this. So this is the, the problem of uh, product-free sets um, so this, um, so if you have a group, we, we say that a, a set is product free if there's no solution to the equation x, y is equal to z, where x, y, and z are all coming from your set. Uh, so in the, if you're working in an abelian group, this is more commonly called sum free sets, and it's well studied. Um, and there's a, and, and in particular in the in the abelian setting, you can always achieve, you can find sum free sets of constant density. Um, and this led Baba and Schorsch to conjecture that this should be true in any group. Um, but this was uh, disproved by Gowers, uh, a very uh, important paper um, in terms of uh, these kinds of problems. So it's, uh, it's an interesting reason why it's not true. So um, it, he introduced this notion of quasi-randomness of a group, which is based on looking at the, the smallest dimension of a non-trivial uh, representation of the group. And, uh, if, if, this, uh, if this grows, then uh, you can't find large product free sets. Um, and the, the, so the, uh, the more quantitative versions of this worked, worked out by Nikolov and Pieper, but, but there's, so there's, there's some polynomial relationship between the quasi-randomness of the group and the largest density of the product free set. Uh, but for particular groups, say the alternating group, um, uh, you still have the question of what is the answer. Um, this is, was also a question which was highlighted by Baba and Shosh, and um, there's a, a nice construction which was considered a lo uh, long time ago, which is, so if I, if I consider uh, permutations which have the property that um, they map uh, some particular element, say one, uh, called it I there, to, into some set S, And then they map anything which is in S to something which is not in S. Um, and this is clearly product free because if I take the composition, then I map one to something that's not in S, which right, right, so, it's a, so it's a natural construction. And if you optimize the parameters, you see it gives you a, a, a set of density uh, one over square root n. Whereas the bound that comes out of the, uh, uh, the Gower's argument is like n to the minus a third. Uh, so Eberhard, uh, improved this bound to get something which was within the polylog factor at the minimum. Um, and then recently we, we attained the exact results. So these, these are the extremal examples, or the, these are sets and their inverses, and there's also the stability for this. Um, so maybe I try to briefly explain like some of, like what, the, so it, there's a lot of analysis and combinatorics and a bit of representation theory that goes into this, but the sort of the, the thing which gets it off the ground, so is, is you know, where does the stability, how can you say get some kind of approximate structure from this? So to, to see where this comes from, if we uh, go start by looking at Gowers' proof, which is um, the sort of the, um, follows the, the, the framework, which is very common in additive combinatorics, where you, you have some analytic formulation of your problem, you, and then, say, for counting arithmetic progressions, you have a main term which just comes from the density, and then you have an error term which comes from Fourier coefficients, and you want to show that the error term is small compared with the main term. Um, so in this setting here, I want to consider about a, a, a family A, which is living inside AN, of density alpha, um, and well, introduce, I'll call it its characteristic function f, and I want to consider a, a convolution operator which is defined by uh, well, averaging uh, by uh, any function. I take any function g, I map it to a function which is defined by averaging with shifts of f. The point is, is that this is a reformulation of the, 
the product free condition is is to say that the uh, the inner product of f with with f this op operator applied to f has inner product zero. That's oh, you can check. That's just a reformulation of the pro problem of being product free. And then this uh, you can split as a as a, a main term which is coming from the uh, the density just an alpha cubed, and then some error term which comes from projecting onto uh, functions orthogonal to the constant function. Um, and the, and the, the way in which representation theory enters, you can treat it just as a black box. It's just to say that there is a, an eigenvalue bound as soon as you get away from the, the constant function, which is uh, the key thing is, is that you get something which d decays in, in N. Um, and then, so then if you do uh, a, a Cauchy, put this in via cauchy schwarz then you get a bound on this, on this error term um, which well, I won't go over the calculation, but like, this, is, this is the idea of Ga Gauss's bound. You have the, a main term, you have an error term, and the, the error term is controlled by this. this uh, uh, just seeing what happens on the, uh, uh, from the, the eigenvalues on, on, on the space which is orthogonal to the constant functions. Um, Uh, it's, a sim it's a similar kind of calculation. Yeah. Huh? Um, okay, so where, so where does the, like, how, how can you est extract structure from, from this kind of argument? It's, um, it's, it's a similar kind of idea t to Ross, Ross theorem, like where you have this, uh, so similar kind of thing where you're, you're, uh, you're, you're looking for three-term arithmetic progressions, and one case is that you have pseudo-randomness and you find your arithmetic progression. The other is that you don't, and then you, you find some you find some structure. So it's a bit different here in that you, you can't actually uh, show that, that the error term is, is small, but you can show that it goes in the right direction. It can't, be, uh, it can't be very negative. So you have a main term which is alpha cube, and it can't be, you, you can have many more products than you're supposed to, but you can't have many fewer. Um, and the key here is a, again, like a version of this uh, inequality, which I was uh, stating before in the Boolean setting, which says that um, uh, global functions um, are, uh, cannot be low degree. So the, it turns out that the main thing which you need to worry about in this calculation is what happens from linear functions. So a linear function of, on the permutations means it's some combination of, of the indicator of function that I is mapped to J. This is a, the, the, the notion of a linear function for permutations, and uh, if you have a linear function where all of the coefficients are small, then there's a similar kind of uh, right the inequality which says that you uh, you can you can bound the uh, its measure. So it, this is the the analog of of the uh, the kahn kalai linear or, or uh, le level one inequality in this in this setting, and this is uh, this is where the stability. Uh, get started, it says that really the only possibility f f in, for, for not having products uh, is that, that this, when you make this decomposition, there's nothing in, in the global part, everything is stars. So you're very close to a union of stars, and then that's when the, the combinatorial argument starts. So, what does that yeah. mean? Uh, so uh, yeah, sorry, it means uh, like in, in the extremal construction, you map uh, a set, a, a, a a, a single uh, point into some set, right? The, in, the characteristic function of that, right? The, uh, because this, um, this construction, which I'm def defining here, has constant density. If I take S to be size square root n, then this, this is just a constant factor. And the main thing is saying, this element gets mapped to this set of size square root n. And that's a star. Because F star is all of those things. All of the stars, yeah. They, they, there can be lots of them, but... Uh, Right, they can't interact too much with each other. Right? Yeah, they, yeah. All right, so uh, I'm out of time, so I'll just. There's a, there's a weird question mark in the, the size of AIJ question mark epsilon. Uh, that's the, indicating that the, the, if it's larger than epsilon, then you put it in the star part, and if it's less than epsilon, you put it in the global part. <laughs> Deliberate question mark. Not a later, Gary. <laughs> um, 
yeah, uh, I'm out of time, so I'll just you know, put up some, uh, some questions for you to look at. <laughs>